So let's go over the review. So number one was, uh, I forgot, my, thank you. So we have a sequence of null sets and we look at the union of these null sets. Well, by one of the properties of measures, this is less than this. And each one of these is zero. So you have, you have a sum which may be infinite of null terms. Therefore, you get something equal to zero. Since uh, your mu of anything is positive, you know that this thing must be equal to zero. Okay, so if you do a countable uh, union of null sets, you get a null set. Now, what if your union is not countable? What did you answer to that? Is it still true? No, why not? Right. Exactly. If you do union over all x's where your x belongs to 0, 1, well, if we, and if we use mu as uh, the Lebesgue measure, we have seen that mu of x is always 0. But the union of x when x belongs to 0, 1, is really the set 0, 1. And the Lebesgue measure of 0, 1 is 1. So the property does not hold if your union is uncountable. OK? So. You see that uh, you may have differences. OK, number two. We'd like to write the closed set 0, 1 as an intersection of uh, open sets. Well, for instance, we could do this. <coughs> and uh, on, on this homework, I saw that you're still not very comfortable with this type of question. You really need to be careful and prove a double inclusion. Otherwise, you write things that are not true. Okay. So you, you really need to be very careful in the way you prove these things because it's important. So let's prove a double inclusion. If I have x belonging to 0, 1, then x belongs to minus 1 over n, 1 plus 1 over n, because this is a subset. This is bigger than This is bigger than the set 0, 1. So if x belong in here, it must belong in here. And it must belong in here for every n. If it belongs in here for every n, it belongs to the intersection. So there isn't much to do, but there is something, OK? Always. I mean, uh, there is a step. It's not automatic. And then you do the other inclusion. Which is that if x belongs to 
this intersection, then x is strictly between minus 1 over n and 1 plus 1 over n. And it's very important that it's for every n. If I were taking the union, of course, I, I would know that this is true for some n. It's very important that it's true for every n, because then we can pass to the limit, and we can say that this goes to 0, the inequalities become large, and that's what we get. Therefore, x must belong to 0, 1. And we have this other inclusion. So now the double inclusion is proved, and the equality there is a true equality. Now the, sec the second question of, so this is still 2a. The second question was, could I do, instead of doing an intersection, this is quite arbitrary, I and mean, there are several ways to do this, could I do a union of open sets? No. Why not? The union of open sets is open. Okay? That's not going to happen. It's never going to be equal to a closed set. Okay? So this is not possible. No, because that's a property that uh, we have seen, and so you don't, unless you are explicitly asked to prove it. Okay? But uh, if not, everything which was proved in class or in the homework is common knowledge, and you can use it just by saying that. Okay, number three is about uh, this function. So we have a function. f, which is defined as mu of minus infinity x, and I think uh, it's closed at the x, and the first question is, uh, what's What's the domain of of f? Well, uh, you can you can do this for any x. Okay, you can always measure minus infinity x. Doesn't matter what x is. So your domain is clearly all of R. The range of f is always included in the positive numbers because mu of anything is a positive number. But it may or may not be equal to the positive numbers. Okay, so you you didn't quite have enough information here to answer. Okay. What you can discuss the different possibilities. Uh, if mu is on a bag measure. Then what's mu of minus infinity x for the Lebesgue measure? Infinity, OK? So if mu is the Lebesgue measure, for instance, f is infinity for every x. If uh, you could have something. Uh, you could have something discrete. 
for instance, if mu of k is pk, okay, uh, uh, a probability measure on the naturals, okay, your k belongs to the naturals. Then uh, what happens is that mu of minus infinity uh, x is going to be zero if x is less than one. Because the first uh, weight is on one. You get p1, then on two. So anything before one e has a weight of zero. Then mu of minus infinity uh, x is going to be p1 if your x is between 1 and 2. Okay, because there is only 1 in there, which has a weight different from 0. Then if you do mu Uh, for x between uh, 1 and, well, I shouldn't, I don't need this three. If x is less than 3, that's all I need. And this is x, well, no, but uh, then it doesn't quite work. No, I do need bigger than 1 here. Uh, I want to go right, so no, I do need this. Between two, between two and three, uh, right. Between two and three, I'm going to get p1 plus p2, and so on. So the different uh, uh, the, the range is going to be p1. It's going to be zero. P1 in a case like that, the range would be uh, a countable set zero, p1, p1 plus p2. P1 plus P2 plus P3, and so on. So depending what your mu is, you get many different answers. But all your answers are going to be in the positive realms. Then uh, for B, you were asked to show that it's a Borel measurable function. Uh, so what argument uh, should we use to show that it's a Borel measurable function? Monoton is a very good idea. Monoton avoids any work. We know that monoton functions are Borel measurables. So that's all we need. So how do we know it's monoton? Well, if x1 is less than x2, then mu infinity, minus infinity x1 is included in minus infinity x2. And therefore, when we take mu's, we get this inequality. And therefore, f of x1 is less than f of x2. So f is increasing. And therefore, is Borel measurable. Okay, for four, we wanted the formula for f complement of E. So,
So I assume that E is included in F. <coughs> and uh, we can write that F is F E union F E complement okay, to these joint sets. Therefore, mu of F is mu of F E plus mu of F E complement. So mu of F is mu E. So this is where I'm using the fact that E is in F. So the intersection must be E plus mu of F E complement. Now, in order to uh, get the formula which is in my statement, I need to know that mu of E is finite. Otherwise, I may have, I may be in a situation where I have minus positive infinity minus infinity, and I don't want that. Okay, so that's missing from my question. Yes. Correct. Yeah. 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 And if they are both infinite, it's at this point it works. I mean, this formula is correct. The problem is that if I want to to get the other formula, then I need some uh, some condition. So if mu of e is finite, then mu of f e complement is mu of f minus mu of e. So uh, another notation for this, in a case like that, is f minus e. This is what we mean. It's f uh, intersect with a complement of e. Better to use uh, this as a notation, I think, because then it's clear what we mean. Okay, so the next one we have a, a, a sequence of measurable sets, and the union of these measurable sets has a measure which is finite, and we are also told that mu of e i is bigger than a for infinitely many i. Okay, for some. Uh, some some positive a, and we want to conclude that mu of the limb sub is strictly positive. That's what we'd like. So uh, this is very similar to things we have done already. Uh, if we define f n to be the union of e i for e for i bigger than n, uh, we see that our f n is a decreasing sequence of measurable sets. And uh, we can use, and so F1 is the total thing. And therefore, mu of F1 by hypothesis, mu of F1 is finite. So remember that when you have an increasing sequence of sets, you don't need any, con any uh, condition. The mu of Fn converges to mu of the union. Okay? But when it's decreasing, you need that condition there in order to uh, have a corresponding result, which tells you that the limit of mu of Fn is, exists and is mu of intersection of all Fn. But the intersection of the fence corresponds exactly to the limb sub 
of V A. Now uh, we need to make variation between ENs and the FNs. Well, uh, clearly EN is included in FN because that's the first guy here in my union. So FN is a bigger set than EN. Therefore, mu of EN is less than mu of FN. And uh, I want basically to say that the limit of this is bigger than A, for instance, and then I'll be done. I don't know that there is a limit, so I need to be careful. And what I can do is simply talk about the limb sub. And the question is, So if mu of EI is bigger than A for infinitely many I's, I'd like to say that the limb sub of mu of EI is also bigger than A. OK? So uh, at this point, there is a little work to, to be done. If this were a true inequality true for any i, then you just take limb subs on both sides, and you're done. But it's not a true inequality for, it's not necessarily true for every i. So you need to do something. You need to argue why you can still take your limb sub. And w one way to do it is to say the following. Well, if I have infinitely many i's, I can build a sequence of i's. You see, I can, I can build i1 less than i2, less than in, and so on, such that mu of e i k is always bigger than a for every k. OK, because it's true for inf infinitely many i's, so I pick one. And then there is one which is bigger, because otherwise it means there are only finitely many of these eyes. So just by you know, the very definition of what it means for infinitely many eyes, you get this. Now you can say, well, my limb sub over all k's of mu of e i k is bigger than a. And then uh, you can also argue that the sum of or n of mu of e n is necessarily bigger than the limb sum over k of mu of e i k. Why is that? Why is this a true statement? The limb sub of a subsequent is always going to be less than the limb sub of my whole sequence. Because the, the limb sub is obtained, we, we know that uh, this limb sub can be achieved by taking a subsequence. So I have a sub subsequence converging to this guy. But my sub-subsequence is also a subsequence of this guy. So certainly, if this goes here, I can go at least as high, and maybe higher. Okay? It's uh, this idea that the limb sub is a limit of a subsequence. Okay? It's, it's the highest possible limit of a subsequence. So to, to write it formally, 
is uh, not very difficult, but it's kind of kind of cumbersome. So I'm not going to do it. But uh, you see that there were a few steps here that need at least to be explained. But uh, you you are understanding what you are doing. Once we do this, then we are done now because so this is bigger. Okay, so our argument shows that the limb sub of mu of e n is at least uh, as large as a, and then when we we go back to this guy here, and we say, okay, I have mu of e n less than mu of f n, and now I have limb sub of mu of e n less than limb sub of mu of f n. And this, as we just proved, is bigger than A. So mu of link sub of my E ends, which is this guy here, this is exactly mu of the link sub of the E ends, is at least as large as A, which is itself positive. So we got a better result than what was asked. Not only it's positive, it's actually larger than A. Questions? Well, the example that shows that if A does not hold, is always the same. You can take. you do is you take, for instance, En equal to uh, minus infinity n. You take uh, the Lebesgue measure, and you uh, I want the limb sub, so I should take n positive infinity. So then uh, what we do is Fn, which is the union over all Ei for i larger than n. Well, this is exactly uh, En, n positive infinity, because you, you take uh, En is a decreasing sequence. That's why. In n. So Fn is this thing, and the intersection of Fn is empty. You, you look at all the numbers that are bigger than n. So uh, mu of the limb sub of e n in this case is 0. But each one of the mu of e n is infinity. So it's bigger than a in particular. So you see that uh, you, your, your limb sub is the empty set. OK? OK, 6. We'd like a sigma algebra. So we'd like a sigma algebra containing A, and uh, the smallest sigma algebra containing A is going to be is going to be the empty X A and complement of A. And it may be less uh, elements in it because maybe some of these two are the same thing. Well, it depends. If you, if you start, for instance, with, but uh, so if you start with a equal x, for instance, you just get these two. 
because all, all the others are the same. So uh, what you need to check, at least mentally, is that uh, if you take any union of these elements, you're still in here. And that's pretty clear. OK, nothing really can happen uh, to get you outside. And if you take the complement of any of these elements, you are still in here too. That's what the definition of a sigma algebra is. OK? B is less amusing, I must say. So for B, you, you have two, two sets, A1 and A2. And you want to show that you have at most 16. Well, it's messier. Uh, you can write things. So you have the empty set. You have x, you have A1, you have A2. Then uh, you have all the, well, then you have uh, the complement of A1, the complement of A2. So that gives you already six. These six must be in there. Then you do a different intersections. So you can do A1, A2, A1, A2 complement, A2, A1 complement, A1 complement, A2 complement. Then you do the unions, uh, A1 union A2, A1 union A2 complement, A1 complement union A2, uh, A1 complement union A2 complement. And that brings us to 1, 2, 3, 4. 6, 8, 10, 14. Okay? And then, uh, if your A1 and A2 are like this, uh, something we haven't yet is this set. And that certainly should be in the sigma algebra. Because that's, uh, that's what? That's A1 union A2 intersect. A1, A2 complement. And that's not one of the ones we had. Not, not obviously. I mean, in certain cases, you, you may get it. But um, what this is, so we can, we can compute this. Uh, using distributivity and we get what? So we, we, we do the distributivity which is A1 intersect with this guy, that's the empty set, so I don't write it. A1 uh, intersect of this one and then union A2 intersect this. Okay, so we get this guy here, and we, we also need the complement of uh, this one, and that's our 16th element. Okay, when we do the complement of uh, A1, A2, union, A2, A1. So that's uh, A1 complement A2 intersect A1 union. Uh, no, let's see. These are unions. So we get A1 union A2 intersect A1 union A2 complement. And this thing, again, can be written as A1 complement A2 complement union A1 A2. So that would give us uh, 16 elements. But 
I mean, the, the question is not so easy because now we would need to argue that it's stable under complement, which is okay. That that you can check rather easily. But that also that it's stable under different unions. So it may take quite a bit of time to do that. That this is actually a sigma algebra, unless there is some something I'm not saying to check that, but. Uh, I think you need to, de to do it by hand, uh, you know, which uh, with 16 elements already you have quite a few possibilities. Okay? So not a great question. I'll do the questions before the test, don't worry. So I will only ask you questions I know how to do. Questions on the review. So what did you think of a review? Reasonable? Um, excuse me? Uh -huh. Yeah, so that, that's going to be my template. And uh, you're not going to get the same problems. And you should have a good look at the homework problems. And also some of the proofs we did in class, I mean, if, if you have time. So the first thing is concentrate on the review. Second thing, homework problems. Third thing, if you have time, start re redoing simple proofs. Uh, You're not going to have two pages proof to do in the test. But to, to redo proofs is a very good exercise, in my opinion. Okay, you, you learn a lot. S uh, the, in particular, the simple ones, the short ones. I'd like to redo one one thing we did last time because I uh, uh, I was tired by the end and uh, uh, I didn't quite finish it. So let me. We are still in this same section. Uh, what is it? Two point two, and we are in the process of uh, defining uh, the Lebesgue integral. So what we did so far was introduce simple functions. So a simple function. is a function that you can write like this. Where the AI are measurable. Okay, as always we, we are given a triplet X M mu. And the definition of uh, the, the Lebesgue integral of phi is simply this. Okay, and we saw several properties of uh, simple of the integral of simple functions. One so one of the properties was that. Uh, if you define 
for E belonging to M, you define nu of E as being the integral of 1 E phi d mu. So you need phi to be measured, to be simple. So you define nu like this, then nu is a measure on M. Which is what we do in probability over time. Okay, we you want uh, a new distribution? Well, you do that. You take the Lebesgue measure, and you give yourself a phi. For instance, a Gaussian curve, or uh, the uniform. Okay, all, all the probability distributions are built like that, and they are all measures. So uh, we'd like to prove that. And we did it last time, but let me redo it. So let's take a union, a sequence EN in M, and let's compute nu of union of EN. And the EN must be our disjoint. Well, according to our definition, this is the integral of 1 union of EN phi to simplify a little the notation, let's call this guy the union, let's call it E. Okay, so, uh, yeah, this is a simple function, okay, one, one e times phi is going to be one e times the sum of a i one a i, but you can write sum of a i one a i e, okay? Because when I multiply indicators, I get the indicator of the intersection, and so this turns out to be simple. And therefore, uh, the integral one e phi d mu is, by definition, sum of A i nu of A i e. Okay, that's how we define the integral of a simple function. So we're just using the definition. But mu we know is a measure. And that's mu of A i union intersect of the union of E i's for i larger than 1. Uh, I need to use, let's use n here. And so this is mu of the union or n of A i E n. Okay, so for a fixed i, I'm doing a computation. Now, the a, i, e, n are all disjoint because the a, i, s are dis the e, n's are disjoint. So if you do intersection with the same set over time, you are still going to get something disjoint. So this is the sum over all n of mu a, i, e because mu is a measure. And so uh, the integral 1 e phi d mu is 
the first sum I equal to n of a i times sum of over o n of mu a i e. Uh, this is e n. Okay, just uh, putting things together. Now, and this is where I tripped last time. This is only the limit as k goes to infinity of the sum from n equal 1 to k of mu of a i e n. Okay, the definition of infinite series is the limit of a partial sum. That's what it means. And here I have a finite sum of limits. So it's a limit of a finite sum. Okay, because you have only f finitely many limits, n of them. Therefore, you can say that this is the limit as k goes to infinity of a sum of ai sum from n equal 1 to k of mu of ai en. And all of that is done so that here inside, now you have a double sum, which is finite. If it's finite, you can interchange your order as you wish, which is what we're going to do. Limit as k goes to infinity of sum from n equal 1 to k of sum from i equal 1 to n of ai mu of ai en. And this thing here, the, the inside thing here, is exactly the integral of phi 1 en phi d mu. Right? This is exactly how I compute this integral. It uh, must be written here. Here it is. That's my integral. Okay? So, and that, by definition, that's also my mu of the n. Okay? So this is equal to that, which is equal to mu of the n, by definition. Therefore, what we have is, so when we replace this, We have that this is the limit as k goes to infinity of the sum from n equal 1 to k of nu pn. And that, by definition, is the infinite series n equal 1 to infinity nu of here. So in case you don't remember what we started with, we started with mu of union of the ends, and we ended up with the sum, which is what we wanted. Okay, our first line was mu of the union of the ends. Okay, so now that we have a nice collection of results for simple functions, for the integ integral of simple functions, let's go to positive functions. So the definition is uh, take f to be positive or zero and measurable. That's what he calls L plus, 
which is a terrible notation. L means something else. But anyway, that's, that's what L plus is. Because L1, for instance, LP is very important. Uh, and they all mean the same thing. L plus has little to do with it. Then define the, the integral of f with respect to mu as the supremum of all the phi d mu, where phi is simple and is less than f. Okay, you, we have defined the integral of a simple function. Well, take all the simple functions that are below f and take the supremum of these guys and call this the integral of f. That's what we're saying. Okay? Now, what if the supremum doesn't exist? After all, the supremum exists, not or, not, doesn't always exist. Sometimes my set is unbounded. What do I do then? It's infinity if the supremum does not exist. Okay? So as always, infinity is a perfectly uh, acceptable value for my integral, be it a simple function or uh, a positive function. So now uh, let's prove a few properties. If C is a positive constant, then uh, C F d mu is going to be C F d mu. Well, that's uh, it's it's really uh, it's easy to see because it's not so, so easy to write maybe, but it's easy to see because what you are going to do is multiply your simple functions by c. You still get the simple function. And your CF, your C phi is less than CF. Now, what's going to happen is that if the set with multiplying by C is infinite, then the, the set where you are not multiplying by C is also infinite. And so the supremum, they, they either both exist or they don't. So if it's infinity, it's going to be infinity on both sides. That should be clear. Uh, un unless we're talking about c equals zero, where in which case it's clear that your integral is going to be zero. Okay? That's not uh, a problem. Now, if it's finite, then what you're doing is uh, multiplying by a constant. So the supremum of a set where you're multiplying everybody by a constant, but by a positive constant, is going to give you that, you see what I'm saying, is that if, if you have b, as being over C X's, where X belongs to A, then the supremum of B is C times the supremum of A. Okay, that's, that's the result we are using here. That's all we are saying. Okay? So that's the only thing to, to notice to get this result. So I, I won't say more than that. following property, if f, so we take always positive measurable functions, then, uh, yeah, if f is less than g, we have 
the integral of f d mu, which is going to be less than the integral of g d mu. This again is going to be uh, an easy consequence of these uh, uh, proper properties on subs. <coughs> so this time, what we what we are going to uh, claim is that the the set of phi where phi is simple and phi is between 0 and f is included in the set where phi is simple and where well, actually I should take the integrals. So phi d mu. Right, phi d mu, phi is simple, and phi is between 0 and g. Why do we have this inclusion? Well, it's because if phi is less than f, then phi is less than g, because f is less than g. Therefore, if your phi is in this set, then it must be in this one too. So now we are in the situation where A is included in B. What can I say about sub A and sub B? Okay, for the infimum, it goes the other way around. But for, for the supremum, you get this inequality. And that's all we have, because then this is the integral of f, and this is the integral of g, and we have proved our inequality. OK. Now, before we show that uh, uh, the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals, we are going first to prove a, a so-called monotone convergence theorem. Do you want to take a break now or later on? <laughs> it is well, not very long, but uh, I'd like you to enjoy it. So let's take a break now. <laughs>